walk you through the various budget iterations that we've had. <clears throat> we are presenting a 3.26% increase tonight, uh, which is just over $166,000 and we're talking to the second uh, So we start the um, budget process by taking input from key stakeholders, so principal administration, uh, directors of various departments such as special education facilities, uh, IT. Um, we take all of the wants and needs, put them together, uh, and then start developing the budget. So we take that hybrid approach of looking at level services. So we're replicating what happened uh, the prior year for staffing um, and services provided to students, as well as looking at new initiatives. We did discuss new initiatives um, prior to her budget presentation to school committee. Uh, administratively, we pulled those items out because they were going to significantly increase the budget. And when looking at what our level service number was, um, we were going to be well over 5% even at level services. So it didn't feel appropriate administratively to be asking for additional staffing, given what the existing climate of the budget was at that time. So that was going to be two new positions uh, on the teacher contract. Uh, to support students, staff, and um, faculty and staff, or, or families within the district. So we pulled those out. Um, looking at level services, again, we replicated all of the dis existing staffing and programs. That includes a increase for wage obligations, uh, non-salary expenditures that account for inflation, and then um, any adjustments for revolving fund revenue. So we help supplement the budget with other funding sources, such as grants and revolving funds. When those funds cannot continue to carry our expenditures, for example, Deerfield used to have a stronger, um, I don't want to say stronger, we can think that's the wrong way, used to have students coming into the school for the special education program that would be tuitioned in from another district. So that district is paying us tuition for the students. We no longer have a student enrolled that's paying tuition in that way. At one point we did, we had used those funds to help pay expenses. Without that revenue, we can no longer continue to pay those expenditures. When that happens, you have to find another place to fund those costs because they're not necessarily related to that student that was coming in. For example, if we were bringing in 50000 in tuition, we were using that 50000 to help with the transportation costs, not related to that call, just generally. To help fund the school. So if we lose that revenue, our revolving fund uh, costs have to get moved on to another funding source if there's something that has to be maintained. So that had a significant impact for Deerfield this year. Um, between various changes in the early childhood fund, the special education fund, and then seeing a decrease in our school choice uh, revenue coming in, we had to pull $182,000 off of those revolving funds and put those on to the general fund. That's a significant amount for a small school to tackle. Uh, on top of wage adjustments for COLA, which based on our contract for ISD this year is 2%, uh, plus step increases and in any column movement for anyone who was advancing their degree, uh, as well as non salary staff. So administrative staff, secretaries, custodians, food service, central office, all of those wages are built in. That increase was 162000 And then we had a $20,000 increase for non-salary facilities related uh, Those were for existing expenses. Basically, like the trash line has been over budget for several years, for example. Um, so we're trying to right side those accounts and fully fund properly so that we can pay for our expenses. So those pieces at level services increased the budget uh, by 7.15% or just shy of $365,000, which is why we pulled those new initiatives off, even though that the administration felt they were really important needs. This starting point was significantly higher than we've been uh, in prior years and a very uncomfortable position, not one that we would want to bring to our town necessarily. 
So uh, we started to do some work to make changes. So the second draft that we discussed, I believe at the February meeting, um, included some reductions. They were both natural changes that happened. So we had a personnel change to the resignation, and then a change in transportation costs uh, after looking at existing routes for next year, what we were going to need. We knew that there was some time, and we were able to reduce transportation down. So those two pieces helped us bring the budget from 7.15 to 5.25% increase. Again, level services, no new initiatives, just covering our existing staff. So for anyone who listened to the February meeting or was here in person, um, there was lengthy discussion about the budget at that meeting and how we continue to bring down the 5.25 because it's still significantly higher than the school has been in many years. Um, and it wasn't a number that we were comfortable moving forward with. So it forced us to look at our options uh, and the largest conversation at that meeting took place around enrollment and the number of class sections per grade and uh, reducing staffing in sections based on enrollment. Uh, ultimately, the school committee decided to reduce two grade levels uh, by a section each, so classes that had been at three sections are going to be reduced down to two. And there was discussion of a third grade level also being reduced uh, we talked about paying, holding off on that change another year, seeing what happens with enrollment, and continuing to fund that section with uh, revolving funds or grants if we can. Uh, we'll probably end up using ESSA funding for that for at least one school year. Um, and we, I just want to acknowledge that those were really difficult things for us to talk about last month. If you didn't get a chance to listen, please know that the decision to make these changes was not made lightly. Um, we understand the impact on the culture of the school, the community, the parents, the staff, the kids. Um, but in order to bring this down, reduction of personnel is the only way to do that when you don't have other funding sources available. Uh, so we did make that decision to reduce, it'll, it'll basically pull off two faculty positions. Existing IAs, uh, we talked about maintaining no reduction in instructional assistant staff. So anyone who was in a class, you know, that third section will just get reorganized based on um, what you know, comes up with for a plan for staffing. Any questions about any of that before we continue on? I should thank all the speakers so much. I should have said at the beginning, um, we'll be discussing the budget tonight and getting input from the public, but we will not be voting. We'll be voting into the staff. Okay, so if there's no questions, uh, the only other thing that I have, you can see the budget increase there I mentioned at the beginning is 3.26%. Uh, total general fund of 5.2 million. We'll use another 750,000 of grant and some revolving fund money to fully fund just over 6 million for a budget for operations. Uh, and then I believe I gave you the existing enrollment data. as well as the uh, historical. So again, we, we haven't been over 3.5% in several years. I think if we even look that farther than that, um, I'm sure Tina and Barry is going to test as it was before my time. You know, staying around that 3% is a comfortable number for us. We feel like our, our towns will support that and be able to fund without a significant level of hardship. So coming in at 7.15 or even the 5.25 just was very uncomfortable for us, especially in a year um, where enrollment is down and we could make some decisions based on class sizes and, and existing students. Uh, the only th other thing I want to say before we go to comments is that I want to make it known, and we talked about this at the last meeting as well, that I don't foresee this as a one-year fiscal plan. I see this as a multi-year challenge. Uh, if we use ESSER funds to pay for that third faculty position that we were talking about reducing based on enrollment, ESSER funds run out in September of 25. So we're sort of prolonging a problem with that. We will have to look at enrollment again. There could be additional reductions in sections if it's enrollment driven and we don't have another funding source. 
Uh, and we will have to continue to look at our revolving funds and make sure that there's no additional problems with expenditures. I don't have anything else. That's for this Just for summary, but happy to take questions. Uh, Shelly, I just said, did you just say ESSER funds run out in September of 25 or 24? <laughs> Oh, 24. It's fiscal 25, yes. Fiscal 25, but September of 24. Thank you for correcting me. That's a, yeah, that's an important distinction to make. <laughs> so, um, I can't. <laughs> if you could speak up a little bit, it's just um, folks who are farther away from the mic, are, it's hard to hear. No one said anything yet. They're just kind of chatting amongst themselves. Oh, okay. I, I suppose I'm used to hearing it by sitting next to them, so sorry. <laughs> um, could you put up, you had um, sent a general, not line by line, but department by department, budget plan is it possible to put that up for people to look at i had a couple of questions off of it so At least I thought you did. Yeah. It's coming for getting it. Oh, okay. <laughs> now all of a sudden my copy won't come up <laughs> on my computer <laughs> or my iPad. <laughs> Is there something in particular, Ken, you want me to go through or? Uh, sure. Well, let me, I, I just had written, jotted down a couple of things in, on the numbers because the numbers don't provide, there it is, <laughs> because the numbers don't provide a lot. Um, I, I mean, I went back and answered some of my initial questions just by looking at the current general fund uh, summary. Um, but I did notice um, testing and assessment has about a seven seven and a half percent increase i just it's kind of a just a question of what what might be involved in that kind of a number it's a five thousand dollar increase on a seventy thousand dollar budget okay. Are you looking testing. at 2720, that testing and assessment line? Uh, yes. Uh, that is entirely a wage increase based on COLA and STEP for a okay. teaching position in that line item. So that 2720 accounts for um, testing, software, supplies, and materials for regular education and special education, so direct testing of student assessments, as right. well as guidance staff. Okay. Thank you. That I, fi I thought that might be what it was, but I, without the detail, I couldn't tell. Um, so the, the thing that inflates the salaries over the 2% is the step increase. And oh, absolutely. I, I understand that. <laughs> Typically, that's about 3% for anyone else who's curious of what that looks like. Um, it's usually about 3% for a step. However, if somebody does have column movement, that adds to the increase as well. Or right. they're stepping from 
um, uh, 13 to 14, there's a significant increase there because we sit at that 14 for so long. Um, mm -hmm. That's why that's about 7%, as you said, is because that step is in there as well. Sure. What else you got for me? Um, I, I should probably know exactly why, but is transportation really going up by 88% next year? I can't remember why it would be doing that. Uh, so we moved some of the transportation yeah. expense off of the revolving fund because we no longer right. have special education transportation revolving money coming in. Right. I just, so I, there is an increase to costs. Our routes are costing us more. But it's mm -hmm. early because we were paying 60000 from revolving, and we can no longer do that. Right. I just, I just think for the public, it's important that they know that. Yeah. I, and um, wanted to make sure. Um, I noticed that heating is, you've left heating flat for next year. Are we under budget this year? <laughs> um, so I left the, the facilities and any utility related items as they are. Uh, one, I may have increased them in that initial budget that we had, but we brought some of those back down to try to bring the budget number down. Right. But we'll look at a multi-year uh, historical data, which for heat is a little bit tricky because we're seeing up so significantly. Um, but I'm honestly banking on that we'll have savings from another account line if that does go over budget. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, another one that I didn't see the level of detail on, um, I, I got a partial answer when I looked into the general fund this year, but building security has a fairly significant increase as well, about 72%. What line item are you looking at? Then? I, I, unfortunately, I took all my notes off of the um, document you have there, and I, I, can't, I can't pull it up on my iPad here. I don't know what I did wrong, but it's not coming up for me. Thank you. So that is the testing and inspections line. So that covers the Siemens contract that we've talked okay. about repeatedly moving to this from the right. general repairs. So yeah. that, that's the true cost of that contract. Right. Yeah. I just, uh, my memory is good, but it's, it's getting shorter and shorter. And I couldn't remember what we were moving there, but I knew something got moved. <laughs> so, um, and those were my primary questions coming out of it. Great, thank you. Um, you can speak loudly or if you want to move closer. No, that's okay, I can speak up. Uh, Jim Cambius, I'm on the Deerfield Finance Committee. I seem to be the only one over here tonight. Um, would you mind breaking down the, um, the paraprofessional, the section 2330, the instructional assistance? Um, because uh, how many classroom assistants and um, forgive me for not knowing what is a KIA? I assume that's an assistant as well. Um, kindergarten. Okay. How many uh, individuals do these represent? So we have uh, 28 instructional assistants in the budget. Uh, and that is high, not because we added positions, but because we moved items off of some revolving funds because couldn't carry them. So early childhood and school choice revenues are expected to be down next year. So in order to not overspend too much on what we're bringing in, we shifted that expense onto general funds. We have not added any new instructional assistance in this budget. Well, in fact, I wanted to ask as a follow-up, since you're reducing the class sections into the grade level, will that be reflected with any, by any reduction in the we are not reducing uh, our number of IAs. Currently, there are not enough IAs budgeted to have at least one per classroom. Um, several of our IAs are in one-to-one -one positions where they're dedicated to a specific student based on an IEP. Um, and as a administration and school committee, we felt really strongly, even with the reduction in class sections, that it was important to keep our staff maintained so that the teachers and the students have the support that they need, given a significant change as well. 
And yes, I, I don't know if Tina could. I'm sorry. So with the with the consolidated class sizes are going up as well, so it, it wouldn't make um, it wouldn't be a factor in the efficient for us to review. It, it might be helpful, Tina, just to talk about instructional assistants and how they're spread throughout the building um, so that the, the general public that's not as much aware as some of us might be has better understanding. I mean, you, you know, Shelly just touched on the fact that you're trying to have hopefully one aid per classroom, but there are all the one-to-ones and everything else that's going on in the building. So our philosophy is a multi-tier system of support, and so having a, an IA in every classroom will help us to meet every student's needs. Right now, we're not set up for that. In um, kindergarten and pre and preschool, eight of our instructional assistants are, are down in that end of the school. I say that end of the school. It feels like it's forever to get to. Um, we have, I believe it's like three in our one two hallway, which is five classrooms. We're pretty thin right now. If you were to ask me what my opinion is, and we have a couple IAs here, I'm sure they'll tell you the same thing as some teachers. Um, we have four down our no, two down our three four hallway. Um, we have a LEAP program here, which, which is um, students that may be out of curriculum or have multiple disabilities and therefore their staff at a higher level. And in our five six, we have a little bit of a heavier group in our five six, there is a lot of energy. And so we have a, um, four IAs down there. So like, when we consolidate classrooms, we're talking about, just for the public also to know, that we're talking about class sizes right now that are 12, 13, and going to 19. With that shift and um, have different profiles in the classroom, we're anticipating that we're going to need some extra support too to also to service them academically and social emotionally. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> I saw you for a point. That's okay. Um, so should I move to where somebody can hear? Um, my name is Lori Tomlin, and I um, am an IA here. And I also have a student here in fifth grade and a student um, in some Um So I have been really following a lot of this kind of on, on different perspectives. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to review a few things that I think are important for people to know, things that I've learned a lot about in the past couple of weeks since the February meeting and going through the numbers and finding out about you know, the differences, the different nuances in rural communities and these formulas and like it's pretty complex. Um, but just um, to kind of segue from what we were talking about with the instructional assistant, I would love to just start with some perspective about that since there are no cuts to IAs right now, but there are also not any significant increases in salaries or positions. And there's also teacher cuts on the agenda. And, you know, I feel these really personally and acutely, and so do so many of the people I'm working with who um, I hear every single day, but don't kind of feel um, like they're knowledgeable enough or secure enough or whatever that they you know, want to come and express their stories. So I'm going to take the liberty of speaking to some of what we um, deal with and are thinking with this budget. Um, to start out with the teacher cuts, um, I work with directly with a couple of newer teachers who feel like they're working sort of on the chopping block. Whether that's true or not, I think there's some like, oh my gosh, am I going to have a job next year? And that's really stressful and really um, to awesome teachers that I like can't even imagine them not being here next year. Um, so that's that's one thing, and those cuts are happening, as you know. Um, the instructional assistants, um, you know, the Massachusetts Teacher Association and Union has been working really hard on some incentives and increasing pay for IAs is one of them, and um, that's a whole other kind of agenda thing to talk about. But I just want to share some of the stories of IAs that I hear every day. Um, 
I have, uh, you know, called the friends, colleagues, whatever, that they, I hear them like I have $7 in my account until Thursday. My electric bill went up. Uh, how do I figure this out? And they're like, literally on their lunch break, on the phone with Eversource, trying to like figure out how they're going to make their next payment. Um, they talk about, you know, roommates. They always have to have roommates. And when one roommate leaves, they scramble for another because they can't afford to live alone. I have, I'm in a two-income family, so like I'm okay, and I have my kids. Like these guys are like, I can't have kids in a place to live. Like they don't have the salary, so they sit there and they talk about, should I go work at a party, or should I just get like a drag and click type of job that pays a lot more than this? But I really love this, and I'm talking about people who are not only great at their job and that are so supportive of the students here, and the students adore them. But I mean, some people have master's degrees, some of us have doctoral degrees. Like, you know, we are really working hard and intensely in really significant roles. And these people, a lot of them are working two and three jobs. They come in early and they do before school, they go to different school after school, they work at, I don't want to say, because I don't want to, you know, invade on anybody's privacy, but they work other jobs at night in addition to what they're doing just to make ends meet. I have one IA colleague who also has young kids, and she's exhausted. She's working all day and still has, you know, kids at night at three, three jobs, three jobs. And she's in a two-income family and has kids, and she's like, I'm just so tired. And they're, they're at their breaking point, and now they're looking at class size increasing, and they're like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And that, like, you know, really hits us at the core of this school. And, you know, we have incredible support from Tina and our administrators, and there's always talk about self-care and teamwork, and we juggle and we work to make it make it all work every day. And this has such a strong team here. And where it shows up mostly is in the students, because we do see their progress, and that is what keeps us going. But there are a lot of people who feel like on the edge of what they they can live on anymore. So those are just so, some of like the, the human stories, and I can go on. Those are just like top of my mind stories. Um, but you know, then we talked about the fair share amendment, which a lot of us kind of rallied and worked towards that, and we're really excited when that passed. And the February meeting, like I wasn't expecting a big fair share amendment way fall. Like I knew that we were still going to have to advocate for allocation of those funds. But I was kind of like, okay, well, I, I didn't think we were going to go backwards. Like, I thought, okay, we're still here, but we're going to move in this good direction. And then I saw, like, cuts and and juggling and ESSER funds and all that. And thank you, too, for all the juggling, because that's horrible to have to do that every year, patch things together. And it seems like we always come back to that with education. We're always the ones having to patch it together with not enough funding. So here's that FSA. And we found out we're not really going to be recipients of that. And you know what? I don't regret the people who, the, the, the schools and the MTA, the transportation people who are getting the funds. I'm psyched for them. They need it. I want everybody to have the funds. But we still have to be funded, too. That doesn't mean that we, it's not, it shouldn't be zero sum. And it's not just the FSA, right? It's the FLA. It's all the things. And Massachusetts prides itself on education, as we should. And I should know, because I come from like number 49 states. Um, and yet, the state is, is spending so little, really, to our town and our regional school that the town then has to pick up the rest. And so, I get why the finance committee and the town is like, oh, crap, because we have a lot of other expenses, and I'm a taxpayer, too, and I don't want my taxes to go up, and you do that with anybody else. So, I get that. And I, I really feel it's so bad we want people to understand that we as a community are in this together, and right now nobody's happy because taxes are going up, we have more expenses, we don't have enough this, that. And really, it's all of us who need to rally to increase funding from the state. And why is that? Because they are really responsible for a higher percentage, and we're not getting enough. And it's not that the money's not there. The money is there in various ways. We have to get more of that money. And so normally, I would be someone who says, no, hey, contact your reps. You gotta you gotta bring us to Boston, right? Well, our representatives happen to be awesome and are on board with this. So 
So for anybody who doesn't know, Natalie Blay and Joe Comerford, I'm sure everybody here knows, but like a lot of public don't even know who represents us. So I'm here to tell you that these people are so involved, are so on board. I found out just the other night how when they were new, this team got them all kind of caught up on things. Then they did this whole commission um, study on um, sustainable world cities. And now they're moving forward with trying to bring that to the legislature to say, this is what it's going to take to have sustainable schools in the world community. And this is what we want. So thank goodness we have like a community who really is cohesively wanting all of these good things and these representatives who are actually working for it. Like that's that's a lot of miracles right there. So we have a lot of miracles. And we have a strong teachers community who also work into these things. So these things are good. Um, what we need to do now as a community really is figure out ways to support our representatives in the bills that they're implementing or, or introducing to be brought to committees in the legislature and passed. And that's, they're kind of at that point right now that they both are um, writing these bills and they're, they're coming up. And I think they named it right after the, um, the commission, the Act for Sustainable Future of World And so we need to get things like that. They're asking for $15 million more dollars in rural funding. Right now, we're at about 5.5. And the new um, budget from the governor is just now is allocating 7.5. They're asking for 60. So that is enormous. And whether it's going to be on, you know, right now or, or over a couple of years, I think that's going to be on the table. That's a lot of money that can change a lot of things. Now, are we going to be recipients of that? Because we're in this weird place of other schools around us have even less money. And so, again, we want them getting the money, but we want them to, right? So... We're it's that formula thing again, which I'm not even gonna to try to figure out, but yeah, I do. <laughs> um, but that formula helps us kind of puts us through the crack. So what's been successful in the past from what I see and hear is sort of like community banding together with other districts and kind of um, having like a coalition to take to the state and demanding that we get those bills heard in committees and passed through committees and approved. Because that's a whole other political thing I won't get into, but some of that stuff doesn't even come up for votes when they do it gets shot down. Well, why is that? Corporate lobbyists are there with the bigger money and the bigger lobbyists, and they get their stuff done. So we need to say, hey, you know what? You're here to serve our communities with our tax dollars and us, not the corporate interest. And I don't think there's anybody who doesn't agree that that's where a lot of the money goes. So, and if you do this really well, go ahead. But so, my thought, and thank you for all the time, but I think this is really important. And I don't think that a lot of people in the community, and even people that I work with, kind of know where is this all coming from and how do I do it? They feel overwhelmed. They're working three jobs, they don't have a lot of time to research this stuff. So, I, my hope is that the town, this is just all I'm going to end tonight, and hope that the town, finance committee, administrators, whoever, will continue to or start to. Right, I'm, I'm sure that you do to some extent. I'm asking with the new information that we have to write to legislators, to the state, and share these stories. Share the stories of the IAs and the pieces that I just shared. Share that our constituents, this is what they're living with and they're worried, and this is what our representatives are doing. And we want and need a demand the support for that. And then as a community, we all have to kind of rally ourselves to also be there and be the the, the, um, we, do we have to let them know that we get this and we're not okay with it. And we are not going to just keep accepting like the answers are cut. We don't see increased enrollment. Like that increases for people spending and then that's in the formula on the whole thing. So cuts can't always be the answer. Like we'll have nothing left. And I've been from a place that got to that point too. And it's a nightmare. And there are schools in Massachusetts that are there too, and I want them to get a lot of funding, but we don't even want to get there. We're already tipping points. And my hope is that the town will really rally with whatever power you have to the legislature, and then as a community and colleagues and parents and um, taxpayers rally and say, this is what we want. You have to show up. Um, and it's hard to get taxpayers 
students who need uh, for chairs or need, need other assistance um, for the quarantine. So it's the eighty thousand dollar figures. That's the number one priority. Yeah, and the only thing that we're asking for. And I'll bet we'll hopefully get a grant for our stuff for sixty thousand under the MVP program. Yeah. The last one, this is I'm throwing out. Uh, I've mentioned it a few areas before, but uh, several years ago, I was you know, listening to the radio or watching TV, and they were talking about some of the schools in either Alabama or Arkansas or something like that. And they mentioned the state universal preschool program. Here we are, school system that spends roughly ten thousand dollars per kid, Arkansas, versus what we spend up here, and we don't have a preschool program. And uh, what? Well, I'm not looking for an answer, but I would really like to see the school committee and the administration take a look at it and at least come next year to the finance committee and say, look, here's what our programs cost. We could add universal preschool for these numbers of that. We had side from the school committee we had conversations with very many people and good money. Um, you know, and um and we're starting to see a way of having our team space be more and more challenged and we have a to work to early as well. Um, so. yeah, and I would you know, probably traditionally, if, if I were looking for a town to live in, and I've got a choice between a town that has a preschool program and one that doesn't, in the case, obviously, uh, then I would look to move to the town that has the school program. I think it's not to say that this is possible, obviously. I think there are benefits. Despite the fact that half of the kids are moving into the school program, not part of the season, it's pretty much a cap. Okay, so the Yep, thank you, uh, Kevin Kittle said. Um, I was just curious in the projections for uh, student enrollment if uh, there was any anticipation of increased uh, families taking their kids out of DES because of the increased in uh, uh, class sizes. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you repeat that? Me, I haven't heard anything, but our class sizes are going up to 19, which is not an unheard of class size. Um, we're really shifting from class sizes of like 13 to 19. We already have class sizes that are at that level now, so we're we're not looking to um, have something that's unheard of. Does that answer your question, Kevin? Well, I'm just I was just curious if it was in the in the uh, projections because. I mean, it's a reality. Class sizes are going up, and that might going to 19, even though it's not unheard of. Families still have the choice to to go out, so that'll cost more. I I would say that families will have the opportunity to go out. Uh, the question is how many schools they'll find in the area that have class sizes, even at the size we're going up to. Uh, not not to say that uh, there aren't schools, but for the most part, we have t typically had student to teacher ratios that are much lower than area schools generally run. And uh, we've been very fortunate to be able to do that. And I think that the increases that we're looking at, uh, the, the class sizes we're looking at changing are in uh, grades where we have enrollments that we just can't afford to have three three sections. We'll be down around 10 or 11 students. And if you have two or three kids out, all of a sudden you're only teaching, out, out sick, you're only teaching seven or eight kids a day 
or seven or eight kids and it's difficult. I, I can't speak as a teacher because I'm not one, but um, in my past role as a, an administrator in another school, uh, when we got down to smaller class sizes, there, you know, there are other issues. So it, it's, it's a balancing act, but I, I, I don't think we've uh, put those kind of, you know, any projections into the, po the possible numbers that would leave. <clears throat> so it might be um, good for me to also clarify that in kindergarten, with incoming kindergarten, we're looking at having a class size of 16. We are not looking to fill the classes, particularly in the lower grades, age 19, with collapsing some of the classrooms for these budgets in the upper grades, um, in fifth grade in particular, the incoming fifth grade going to, they're going to be going to 19 in the upper grades. Our philosophy is to have smaller class sizes in the earlier grades so we can. Um, have more targeted intervention when it's needed. There is a class size of kindergarten this year that was, um, it was not anticipated that we would have 19 in that class because things happened and unfolded that way. That class we are looking at breaking into three sections in first grade and second grade um, may have uh, two sections. So our, our goal is to keep all the class sizes smaller in the lower grades. Um, so I don't want I guess I don't want it to the perception to be out there that we're looking to fill class sizes with 20 and 20 and above. 18 is a good number for us. Um, so when we're consolidating, um, especially in the upper grades, you know, we are not we are not looking to fill kindergarten with 20. I don't know if that provides any more clarification, Kevin. No, that's great. I mean, I, I, one of the things that I think was attractive about Deerfield when we were looking at places to live was you know, small class sizes, and I just don't want it to, you know, become a precedent that, that right. you know, that's the norm, because um, otherwise people just aren't going to move here. No, and, and that's a really good point, so thanks for the opportunity to clarify, because that's yeah. not what we're, I don't think that's what any of the committees, that's not Got what it. Can I Can I just add, just for the people that are uh, home <laughs> listening, um, that if it's really uh, hard to hear and, um, Ken, you're clicking your pencil, your pen. Oh, is sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my bad. I should mute. <laughs> I did have one other query. Um, uh, this is, again, just purely informational. Uh, it's 2440-03-2. Um, uh, two, 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 uh, other support services for um, uh, other instructional services. Could you unpack that? What, what is that? Uh, so cover? that the twenty four forty other instructional services covers um, educational components that are not directly related to classroom support. So summer programming, um, field trips, outside consultants that we bring in for special education. Um, <clears throat> Some administrative costs are in there as well for curriculum directors or if teachers travel and get reimbursed, um, that kind of thing. It's primarily the bulk of that account is for summer school. Of the 81, 65 of it is for summer programming. So that other support services is basically summer programming. Most of it is, yes. Okay. Thank you. And just so you know, if you're like, what is the the logic behind these different sections and why is it seems a little bit more confusing at times. The state requires us to, to set up the, the books that way. So yeah, just they, so you know, like why you, once you put all your staff in one thing, why you, you know they require us to, to set they it. set the function code, so those four digits you're seeing, and then the category description name is set by death. They don't make sense. In most <laughs> cases, they don't make sense. <laughs> I have, I'm sorry. This is more, again, more informational and goes a little bit to what I think Kevin was saying. You can skip. Um, do we know why the enrollment, the special ed choice in enrollments have come down to the point where we don't have any more? I mean, one of the reasons why we moved to Deerfield in the first place is because we knew it was a great school, especially for special ed. And, um, so, I, I mean, it doesn't solve any problems. I'm just curious to know if anyone has any ideas about that. To clarify, you're asking for special ed tuition then? Yeah. Or yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So why? we have more needs in our program. So it goes by what the openings are in the program. And right now, we don't have openings in the program. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because we do such a darn good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, if I could follow up on that, Tina. I, um, the Deerfield Elementary School was one of the first schools in the area to start looking at special needs students and ways that we could support them and not have to send them to programs outside the school. So as Tina was just talking about, uh, we have programs in the school. There are programs throughout Union 38 that have grown, I think initially started, many of them started in the Deerfield School but have moved to the other schools to provide the services and it enables us to keep students in our own schools and not have to send them out and tuition them elsewhere. So, um, just thought I would add that. We still have a very strong special education yeah. program yeah. in the schools. You can kick me from that, this is, this is hard and quick. <laughs> 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 we have that offers, we just can't. So it's not that we're not an attractive school or that the schools are not looking or other schools are not even looking for us to take students. We just we don't have an opening yet. Um, so I'm guessing that the reason we don't have openings is because we don't have money. Because we don't have the money, money. and the staffing mm -hmm. and uh, actually we expanded at if you want to I'm just take curious. A no, we do okay. <laughs> we have residents with higher needs. Yeah, yeah. We have yeah. residents with higher needs. As a matter of fact, for the for the yeah. first time this year, we have two teachers in that program. Yeah. So, but it makes it, you know, those those programs are expensive, and so it is yes. a big hit on the budget. So, <laughs> while we have one or two students, um, or just one student, you're talking about um, almost a percentage point in this budget. You know the, the cost of that tuition coming in right and i guess my follow-up question about funding for special ed um i assume that there's does the school get extra funding from the state for students who have special needs for that extra funding yeah um so we any any money something's called circuit breaker and so basically when we when the expenses go beyond i think the circuit breaker number is right around forty five thousand dollars right now so when our expenses go over $45,000, then that kicks in. And so we pay up to $45,000. Um, the majority of the time you're gonna see that is when we, um, we place students out. And there are students, we do have students that are placed out that um, you know, we just can't make their, need, their needs here. And so we have to pay up to 45, and then they will pay us the following year. So it's kind of a delayed, it's a delayed thing. And then it's a delayed coming off your books when that student you know, um, goes on to the next, the next grade level or ages out of um, there's a portion of the chapter 70 formula as well that accounts for special education students, which increases slightly what you receive for funding based on your special education needs. And then any school choice students that are coming in, we get the, we get the, the direct cost of whatever special ed services they receive in the building. So if you have a school choice students receiving, let's say, speech services, there's a grid that we report that to the state and then we get um, we get payment. I'd just like to make a, a public uh, comment. Uh, I had two, two children in the early education program both um, with special needs, and I just want to um, thank the committee and the school. Um, and you know, when, when my wife said they're, you know, they're, they might be removing positions, it's, it's a shock. And I understand that hearing you all today um, just reaffirms the pride that I carry as a parent of a DES, uh, two DES ch children. Uh, in, in the thoroughness of this conversation, it's clear to me that it's being taken at a really serious level. Um, the, the thing that I think about, I don't know if it's possible if, if it exists now, uh, modeling the anticipated volume of students coming into programs for the anticipated years, and then creating some transparency uh, internally for staff so that, that, that those anxieties that were mentioned beforehand um, those could be addressed in ways that, that are very clear. And if, 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 if the um, 
threshold is 19 students per classroom, and the models are, are trending towards a point where there may need to be cuts, it, it's better to get out in front of those um, because A, the rubber mill is pretty small around these parts. So I think we're <laughs> clarifying that point where uh, that this is, you know, this is not to do it with all of the classes. This is part of just necessary expenditures. But being able to predict that and then get in front of the communication, I think, would be really helpful. The only other suggestion that I have, uh, and this is a little bit long term, but looking at grant opportunities for part-time educators, um, perhaps some innovative innovation funds that could be put in place. Um, so it's not full-time classroom teachers, but they're supplemental educators. I know, uh, I think about Sumner Half School in Springfield. They have some really strong um, uh, K through five programs. And I know that they bring in some grant, grant funded educators that do a lot of great work. So um, if we're looking at cuts, but we still want to continue to enhance uh, support, that might be an opportunity. I don't know if it's already being done, but it's If there's anyone remotely who we've missed raised hands, feel free to jump in now if anyone else wants to speak. <clears throat> I'm not seeing anyone. I don't see any hands here in the room. Uh, any further discussion on the table before we move on? You actually have it in your... Yes, I know we have more further discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but before we move on. Can you date of um, when you're going to take a vote, and then I, I have two different dates right now for when the town meeting is. Is that determined yet? Like, the, um, okay, so I have one that said it's in April 24th, and one that said it's in May. April 24th. May. Yeah. 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 And our next meeting to vote is on the 23rd. So two weeks from March. Uh, if there's no further comments, I would um, close the public hearing portion of the meeting and we'll move on to our regular school committee business. Thank you for everyone who came. Um, I have a fan of you. I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to stay for everything. <laughs> our first order of business is to uh, review and approve the minutes from the very night. Could I, could I suggest two edits or two possible changes? Yes. One, one would be in the um, pr the um, those attending. Note: I should probably be noted as attending virtually. <clears throat> okay. And the second would be that I think the motion on school choice is um, is is worded a little awkwardly. I, I'd like to see if we could say, say a motion to participate in school choice for the fiscal 2024 year as recommended by administration with available slots determined when final enrollments and staffing levels are reached. Can would you just email me the wording? We're going to um, accept. Those. Yeah, I, yes, I can. I can email that or email it to <clears throat> to Jen. Any, no, I'm gonna. Yeah, the only comment was that it was hard to figure out exactly. So I apologize, Ken, for not getting it quite oh, right. <laughs> it's so. not. No, it's not. That's not a problem. You. you the wording you put in was good, but I think this that's a more accurate reflection of what we were trying to get to is we need to Absolutely. see what enrollment and staffing is before we can <clears throat> determine open slots. Gotcha. Yep. Great. Um, do we need to move again if there have been changes? You do it with the change. You do it with the change. So I accept the minutes of February 9, 2023 with the changes. Yeah. 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 Y
that can recommend this. Okay. All right. So we'll um, vote to accept the minutes uh, with the two changes that Ken suggested. Uh, and we'll do a roll call vote because some of us are remote. So, Mary? Yes. Annie? Yes. Carrie? Yes. yes. Ken? We didn't hear you, Ken. If you're muted. Or shake your hand. <laughs> Sorry, hand. I'm muted. I was clicking my pen again. Do you vote to approve the minutes? What's that? We're voting to approve the minutes. Or yes. Yay or no? And I said yes. <laughs> Erica? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, next up, financial statement and warrants. Uh, there were 11 warrants signed electronically since the last meeting, totaling $115,928.34. I did send you out the expense reports. Uh, there's no significant changes. Uh, I am working with payroll on some adjustments for the teacher line and the IA line. Um, we've, we've moved around some funding sources in the current year. Uh, so I'm waiting for some of those to iron out. So the reason I'm telling you that is because it currently shows that the IA line is over by $70,000. It's not over by $70,000. Um, we're sort of shifting where some staff are being paid from currently. So uh, that'll rectify itself as we continue to go through the school year. Otherwise, I don't have anything to comment on this new significant changes. Thank you. You just answered the two questions I'd written down. So <laughs> the only other one I had was I noticed under school choice, um, the out of district tuitions are over I may have missed something in prior meetings but we're what over by about forty thousand dollars in out of district tuitions yeah I think that's a funding source just the purchase order got done wrong Ken I okay. have to work with Karen on cleaning that up um, it was sort of one of those ones she brought to me and was like I gotta get this bill in and I said book it to that line for now and okay. let's clean and, and move it so um, we'll, I'll, I'll connect with her to clean it up before next month if I can, or have a better answer for you if it actually is overages. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions, discussion? Right. Thank you, Shelly. Sure. And thank you for uh, the budget presentation. Yes. <laughs> You're all right, next up is principal's report. I don't have a formal report, but instead, oh, guest speaker. <laughs> <laughs> now for something completely different. <laughs> we'll lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> oh, you might have to do something. <clears throat> so just a brief introduction. I'm Jillian Andrews. Some of you know me, you've met me before. I've been here before speaking a little bit about something that we have as a school-wide initiative. And um, so this is a, a research-based high-impact um, strategy that we're, we're using this year in our school and we've been doing some professional development around it and many teachers are, are including this in our day-to-day -day, um, instructional practices. So we're just going to spend a minute, I think the last time you met you heard Kristen talk about what success criteria looks like and it's always fun to see students and what it looks like, what it looks like on the ground. So Another part of creating success criteria for students is not to do it for students, but rather to do it with them. So this is just another little window into what happens in Deerfield um, in, in some places and something that we're moving towards. So as you are about to watch this video, Tina, can you go back one slide? Or is that? Oh, no, that's I thought slide. you were going to say something else, clearly. Maybe, no, that maybe that, I thought there was a slide before this. Or no? 
that's it. There's two. There's oh. Wow. Sorry. So just as a reminder while Tina's getting that up, so success criteria, just as a little reminder for people who are not educators, success criteria is something that we all do in our lives. So if we're thinking about how are we going to lose weight or how are we going to have a healthy meal, we want to set success criteria up for ourselves. So um, if we don't know what our goal is, if we don't know what the target is, then you can't reach the target. And so we have learning intentions, like this is what we're going to learn today. And then we have that success criteria. And oftentimes what we see in programs and what we do as teachers is we tell children, this is what success looks like. So thank you. So when we, when we do that, it's a powerful instructional method where our students are really clear about what they're learning, but what can lift the level of that for students is to co-construct that criteria with students. And so what that does is allows us to do the following. It allows us to experience a truly student-centered approach to success criteria. It helps us see the purpose and importance in learning and increasing their sense of confidence so that they can meet those expectations rather than it just being handed to them. And it develops their capacity to independently construct success criteria to meet their goals in new contexts, both in and out of school. So oftentimes when we're talking about this with students, we talk about like if you're playing a musical instrument or you do a sport or you are being asked to clean up the chores or you're cleaning up your house or do the shovel the driveway as Darius so often recommends on his <laughs> um, this, These are just different ways. So you can do this at home, but try this at home. Um, so what you'll see, you can go to the next slide, Tina. So as you watch this, I'm going to ask you just to engage in this a little bit and take a mental note of how students are able to do the following, how they can discuss the criteria that they're creating, how they're able to answer the teacher's questions when pushed to defend their criteria, how they're working together, how they're engaged and motivated, and what else. So what you'll see here are some sixth graders who are um, working on some reading, writing about reading, and one of the problems with reading in terms of assessing it and teaching it is that it's invisible. We can't see, we, you know, with writing and with math and with social studies and science, you can see it, it's very visible. There's, there's a product, but with reading, they're doing it quietly. So teachers try to make that, that learning visible. And so what you'll see here are some students. You, you are, um, it was linked to a file folder instead of the file. So I'm just gonna, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just gonna pull it up. So you'll see this in um, one of our sixth grade classrooms and they were broken up into groups and just for some context, they were given some um, samples of what strong student writing about their reading looks like. And they had, all, had many of them, they had a whole pile of it and they had to look at that, um, look at those samples and then decide what does success look like. So is that the one because it was linked to that is it? file? Okay, sorry about that. No, that's yeah. Okay. So, so tell me a little bit about what you guys have been doing. You've been looking at some samples of some some work, some sixth grade writing about their reading, right? And who wants to begin? Who wants to tell me about some of the success criteria that you've already found? So we have, so first we have the ones you came up with, which are Be Creative, Using Graphics and Color, and then the Make Our Write Legible. Then we came up with three more. We have, we can unpack our work and say more about the main topic. I don't know how to read. We give background info and tell the person how our problem happened in the first place. Wait, when you say our problem, what do you mean by that? You're kind of like your claim. Like in how it, like why it affects the like background info. So are you thinking that your your um, entries should have a claim to it? Mm -hmm. Or like a topic that? They should, like you should always, it's good to have a claim that the reader knows what you're talking about. Okay, great. And also the background so, information will support that. Beautiful. And the okay. last one we have is we can make people get hooked and interested in the book you're studying. Great. And that sort of happened just now, right? Sigrid, can you say a little bit about the entry that you were just looking at? There's um, the 57 buses. It seems really good because there's like stereotypes bad influences it seems like drama filled almost mm. and also it seems that they could write a lot easily and come up with so much stuff to work with by just do two characters mm. you know so that's that's a little bit a little window into into why we're all here 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else to report? Or Joliet has. I got more. Um, next up, we have public comment. More public comment. If there's anyone here who has more, more to say. <laughs> <laughs> or remotely, who wants to contribute? All right, here are none. Move on to unfinished business. First up is a capital update, which we got a preview of. Yeah, BC was what I was talking about earlier. We're, we're having discussions about um, the MVP grant. Um, we actually had a meeting this morning looking at the front entrance. Um, and so we're putting that together and see what happens. Not much into it. Thank you. And another conversation regarding the budget. Not as smart as I. <laughs> Anyone? More thoughts on the budget? <laughs> <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Just to just to express my thanks or you know the thanks of the committee to the administrative team and the DES for putting together a very thoughtful budget and going through a, a you know a, a time honored process of developing a budget that we can bring to town meeting and hopefully get the town behind. So thank you to you all. <clears throat> Yeah, good point, and thank you, especially to people. Kelly, thank you for all the work we put together, Shelly Terry, everyone, and uh, everyone who joined us and is here to listen and to share. Thank you. So we're, we'll be voting it in two weeks. Is there any more budget work that happens between now and then? Any other discussions that that's, people would like to that's, see? That's what, so, you know, that really like you've heard feedback, and if the feedback was, you know, Got to lower it, it is, or you get to raise it, you know, that kind of stuff. That's where you were. That's what this part of this meeting is for. You know what I mean? Um, and because then you've got to give us direction um, if we're going to go back and do any um, tinkering with it prior to, to your next time we meet, we'll be voting the budget. So I mean, you, you can, of course, tinker with the budget prior to voting with it, but um, you really shouldn't raise the budget after your public hearing. Mm -hmm. Make sense to the folks there. So another public hearing if you choose to. Have the two finance committee representatives left? Are they one, still there? Only one tonight. Only one. Oh, I'm, that's right. I'm sorry. Skip's on the just on the capital planning. My apologies. I'm so used to Skip being on finance committee. So I just, if we had any thoughts from the 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 loan representative or or not, I just. Unfortunately, every town department has good, solid reasons for raising their budget for three and four and five percent when we were trying to keep it to two and a half. You know? Well, inflation certainly hasn't helped at all this year, so I don't envy you. Uh, okay. <clears throat> So the bill that um, our legislators are talking about, I did ask if any portion, 60 million would be sweet, but any portion of that that happens, if that's available for the year, the 24 year, fiscal year 24. And I was told yes. So how does that work as far as like timing and we vote on a budget, but then if there's is more money. Are you referring to early? Um, it's, it, I guess it would be early. It's with the, it's the, um, I don't know how they're, I don't know if it's considered something different or if it's in with early. Yes, it is, because right now it's at five, right? And it's going up to 7.5. So it's that. So does that come into our district then, or we have to wait on that? Um, so we currently are receiving some rural aid mm -hmm. in Deerfield. Um, we'll, we're using it for a variety of reasons. Uh, more recently, we used it to pay for the parking lot repairs that we had done in the loop in the back of the building. Um, so some of those funds still remain. What are we around? 30, so right now, our, our 38.5 is 38,525 is, is 23. 22 is 28,000. So, you know, it just, in, where you're talking about the big differences if you, 
you, you travel north, um, you know, Bullhawk got 260,000, Hampshire got 134,000, Pioneer got 175,000. Um, right, of course, they're, they're adding them all together. If they're, they're five, they're, they're, but if, they're, if they, they get a new influx of money, which is Right, we don't know. We can't project okay, because so there are some years. Here. There are some of our schools. I'm, I'm using I'm using the five schools of our district. Some years, some of our schools got no funding. It was following year they got money because um, they changed the indicators to try to get more money to more schools. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they're going to how they're going to affect the indicators to make more schools eligible if they give more money, and therefore there'll be less money to go to more the school. The probably it'll be an increase, but not um, percentagely toward the, the amount they increased that here. And so when I met with, and I think I said this, you know, you were a frontier meeting tonight, but when I met with uh, Joe Comerford last Friday, I said, I would like it, you to pass, to do something where we know you can't reduce the amount of rural aid from one year to the next by a certain percentage so that we can say, if you, you can't reduce it by more than 50%, let's we'll just use that number so that we can use that directly to go into the budget. Um, I mean, that would be helpful to us. So right now we don't use that in the budget because we don't know how much is going to be funded and that kind of thing. And so. Um, we could risk it, and some some districts are risking it. They're going to say, you know what, we are, we're going to go off to governors. We don't think it's going to go less than that. We're going to throw that into our budget. Um, we haven't done that. And then also, when Shelly talks about, like, I didn't raise utilities, we'll find money, she kind of knows that these kind of things are coming in to offset that we didn't raise utilities, you know, that kind of thing. So okay. until it gets more stabilized, that's... Then we wouldn't do it until the next... Yeah, and we have experience with that with regional transportation, you know, and so... Deerfield doesn't fall back for regional transportation, but Frontier does, and that number of percentage goes up and down each year of how much they're reimbursing us on that. And if you if you budget wrong, or there's you know there probably uh, nine C cuts this year, but it, they they can cut that money in the school year, then year whatever. So we always usually are conservative around that number. So and this is new funding, so we're learning more. You know. Um, but we won't know until after this budget's already passed. So That's we can't right. count on that funding right. to help supplement. Right. I expect that we'll get more than we did. But like I said with the Chapter 70 formula at the Frontier meeting, the rural aid formula is complicated as well. Deerfield's not in the highest tier right. to receive funds. So even if we get more, there's a lot of other schools above us. Um, and not knowing what that increase is, are they going to give us another 10000 Because that's been the pattern. Um, it helps, and we will certainly find ways to spend it. Um, but it's not, this is part of the reason we haven't used ESSER funds either to fund salaries and wages, is because you can't rely on something that's not consistently funded, and that could, could potentially go away at any time. Mm -hmm. It's much like we're in the position with our revolving funds now that we're having to figure out how to pay for those things. Yeah. All right, so as a school committee, do we want to see any changes to the scheme aid? Or are we ready to move forward with this? Any thoughts? I'm ready to just move forward with what we have. I would just like to say that, you know, for the record, this is, of course, not an easy decision to make. No one wants to be here. Can I make these decisions? Um, and it's it's complicated. It's not. It's not just the budget we're looking at. We're looking at enrollment numbers and what makes sense for the school. And then, how does school choice play into that? Are we making decisions now that will affect our capabilities for taking school choice students in the future? How will that affect things? There's a lot going on. But not a fun decision to make. Yeah, I would just sort of chime in on the same level to say that. You know, it feels like, as Shelley mentioned earlier, we've spent a lot of time on, you know, really trying to ask as many questions as we can to figure out ways to meet this, um, you know, to, to make it an easier um, thing so that we don't have to cut um, positions. But it, it it does feel like we're in, a, in um, you know, kind of caught in this, um, you know, with forces beyond our, you know, uh, beyond our, our, our abilities to solve it, our, you know, ourselves, like, um, so we're doing everything we can, I think, to make sure that um, we're staying 
we're we're doing what we what the best we can. I can I can say that I'm comfortable with moving forward with what we have to get it to the finance committee and see what if we get feedback from them then we can react. But uh, um, I I think this is a number that you know we should at least pass along to the the finance committee to let them know that in two weeks time there's a strong likelihood we'll be passing that number. So I suppose I just want to add one other thing, which is that I'm I'm great glad for the feedback that I've heard today and something that I know is I don't know how much it would actually affect what we have to do right now. Um, but uh, you know communicating I'm glad Darius has been able to be talking with um, the senator and I also plan to you know try to get some feedback to the to the state to make sure I know I, I think maybe others too but you know that we're going to try to make our 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 you know our stories be heard um, because it isn't you know it's not fair to have to um, cut our budgets when there's more money out there. So just wanted to put that in there. All right, so it sounds like we're ready to move forward and we'll vote on the 23rd on the current proposed budget. All right, up in new business, we have a first read of the 23-24 school calendar. So just a little, you, your your folks are, um, you have another school committee meeting between now and April, but the idea is to, you're, I'm sending this out to everybody, that the calendar for next year we do at our joint meeting, and so I want to get everybody a meeting in advance to be able to review it so we can join, we can vote it at the joint meeting when everybody's there, because you can imagine the problem would be if one town doesn't like the calendar another town does so if we're all there then we can kind of hammer out that but at least everybody gets to see it well in advance so it says first reading but we're gonna we're not gonna talk me on the agenda for the next meeting to be held for the joint meeting. so um, and again um, we'll discuss it at the joint meeting but if, unless you see any um, glaring concerns or errors um, you know So again, it's more than that. Thank you. And we also have a first read of the school committee guide. Um, and I want to say thank you to everyone who put work into putting this together. Um, having a guide will be a great resource for new committee members and existing committee members, having all that information in one place and giving us a set place to start from. And again, that is first reading. Um, Jessica Corwin has, um, she kind of half volunteered to help me edit it, and I jumped on board, and now she's full volunteer. So <laughs> it was one of those like, oh, you're now, you have now editing, you know, you just like one click, you're an editor. So it was like, you're now <laughs> editing, right? So you're an editor. Um, but it is really your document. And so like, I kind of got it to a point where I can, I feel like I could hand it off. But um, the idea is that um, it probably, it's gonna be hard to have all things school committee in it because it's gonna be like how many times are you really gonna pick it up after you know it? Um, but it is really, as you said, really strong for you to understand all the, you know, all the different definitions, all the different things you're responsible for, and how things run. And we probably need to need to update it. I think more things. And the, the digital version has all the links so they can go you know, way through the so, um, I was hard. just, I was just gonna comment. Yeah, thank you for for getting this um, going, because this was exactly the kind of thing I was hoping we could have come together. And I do have thoughts, I mean, maybe, I'm not trying to volunteer myself to help, but um, I probably will be helping with, um, to, to just, because I was just thinking things like having links or, you know, of things that are mentioned, you have uh, there, yeah, I, I, was, I was starting to go through it. And actually my question was, how much of the nitty gritty would we be going through here um or and or is there still time to be able to um you know uh you know track uh, give feedback and on on more of the specifics but i i'm, I'm glad it's a 
it's mm-hmm. this is exactly the kind of thing I was hoping to see um, put together. So thank you. So jumping in on that, Erica, um, I did see a few uh, little changes that could be made. So regarding editing, do you want us to forward? It was um, small things like in places where it's frontier committee. And she's already jumped in. Yeah, jumped in. Yeah, if you haven't looked at it in the last today. week, she's already jumped in. Yeah. Okay, but I checked it earlier today. Uh, okay. She got about halfway through. And I think. So, <laughs> okay. if you send it to me, I'll be forwarding it to her. Okay. And, or you can just go straight to her. Okay, all right. Or can you comment? You can probably right? comment right on it. Right. So. I think I have a note without editing. Okay, comment. Yeah, there's, and there's uh, something about meetings, so with the calendar of meetings, and it was Frontiers. The first two years of I think I was looking at the PDF that was in the packet, and that's different from the document that you linked to. So there's probably the changes you were talking about in the doc, the Google Doc that you that you linked to, or something like that, right? Yeah, I think they were in the email that was a couple weeks ago now. Probably. Yeah, yeah. I was just realizing that there's two cop that I was looking at a static copy of it, and that's what you're probably referencing. That there are differences that are things that have been caught up that I haven't seen because I was looking at the room. Yes. I'll often go in through my personal email account, which my frontier one forwards to. That's where I do the vast majority of my correspondence. But then when I go to work on all the shared docs, I have to sign out and sign in under the frontier so that I can do that. But that was my plan. In that one, I'm going to ask that we vote it, that we, it's more of, it's not a policy, it's an agreement that we'll be using that when we have forward so that everybody's kind of on the same. Is that, that document is final, is that something that will be shared publicly? I'm thinking it could be helpful for people considering writing for school Mm -hmm. committee. I can put it on the school committee website. <laughs> I can put it on the school committee website, sure. And right now, if you go to people, a lot of the stuff, MESC, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, they just redid their website. If you haven't been on it in the last month, they, they redid it like last week, or, or launched it last week. And they have a lot of what have roles and responsibilities. And we're starting to link some of that, where Jessica was starting to link some of the stuff in there to that as well. So if anybody has that interest, um, um, go to that site and there's a lot of information there. And there are some differences between committees and some some rules that are set by them that we don't follow because um, they're just very, um, there's like general guidance and then, you know, what do we actually do sometimes is a little different. Too. So we have to. I will say our committee has also just scratched the surface on, and Erica sort of brought this up a couple of meetings ago about our communication to the public as a committee, not necessarily administrations, but like us improving how we get messages out and like some of the things that we're talking about and eliciting some more input, like marketing ourselves a little bit more about showing the community of all the things we do, because lots of people aren't going to like sign in every month and watch a two hour meeting. Understandably, people are very busy. So I think that that's something that we're working on. It's actually outlined in this manual, like there's like a paragraph around you know, communication with the community, um, but just to try to raise awareness about these really important decisions that we're making. And the the school budget is seventy percent of our overall budget as a town. So it's it's just these are really important decisions, and engaging the public the best that we can, I think, is an area that we want to work on as well. Um, well. I think you're providing a really good segue into the next topic on the agenda, which is goal setting for the committee, which is right, <laughs> perfect. the part of the agenda we're even talking about this. Well, I would just say that, you know, certainly, actually, the, the, the handbook was a great um, segue of itself, because um, getting our, you know, having all of us look at, at what Darius has, has put forward, what Jess is doing, um, is definitely one of the things I was hoping we could do, and, and absolutely, like going through and um, I mean, I thought it was interesting too earlier when the comment about, you know, having a pre, you know, uh, the preschool question that had been brought up by the finance 
um, uh, the committee member and just that, uh, you know, like what are, what are those bigger, what, what as a, as the school committee would we be looking to try to um, advocate for? Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is, it's all part, and maybe that by going through that handbook will, will also, you know, generate ideas for us and stuff too. So just keep those thoughts going. We sort of didn't run into both Does anybody have any comments on the, the book we have before we move on? Anything else regarding goal setting? I think I just want to piggyback on something Erica mentioned and some of the audience also mentioned about it. I think part of our communication is like with you know with the public and getting as much community input as possible, but being strategic as a committee about how do we really advocate with our representatives. I don't know if that's as a unit or as individual school committee members or what the best way to do that is, but it is part of, um, and I think the language we used was really nice, was we're in this together and we all have a piece of the, the communication bullhorn and how do we, how do we sort of talk with our legislators at all different levels. And I do think we have a responsibility to try to be cohesive as a committee in doing that, to try to get our needs met. Um, and then obviously hopefully the community will rally too to do some of those things. But you know, I just wanted to highlight that given the discussion that we had today around funding, how important it is to get them on board. And that's also a good goal now. I think that's a great point, thank you. Anything else we want to say? All right, uh, then we'll move on to reports. Uh, the chair has no report. Is there a collaborative report? All right, superintendent's report. Oh, wow. Tonight. <laughs> Sorry, there's no session tonight. So, we're looking for a meeting to adjourn. Make a motion at least. <laughs> Second. I make a motion to adjourn at 7.33 p.m. So a roll call vote. Mary? Yes. Mary, yes. Ken? Yes. Erica? Yes. Thank you very much, everyone.